Hello, everyone, and welcome. Uh, thank you so much for tuning in to our event, Building Climate Resilience in the Urban Arctic. Uh, my name is Brittany Janice, and I'm the Associate Director of the Arctic Initiative at the Belfer Center at the Harvard Kennedy School of Government. Uh, and we are really delighted to have folks here today for a conversation about how cities in the Arctic are responding to the transformations that are happening in the Arctic related to climate change, and to also have a dialogue and a discussion about what are the different lessons that are learned and best practices that are emerging that cities from all around the world can learn uh, from the Arctic, since the Arctic and the cities of the Arctic really are on the front lines of the climate crisis. The Arctic Initiative at the Harvard Kennedy School of Government is a project that's dedicated to learning how what is happening in the Arctic and how that impacts not only the people of the Arctic and the communities there, but also what that means for the world as a whole. And so this conversation is going to be a really fantastic opportunity to begin to unpack some of those some of those questions and talk about uh, resilience and, and also what does resilience mean. Uh, we're going to have an opportunity in this for lots of Q&A, so you'll see the Q&A box. Please feel free to submit your questions through there. We'll have a good chunk of time uh, for people and the audience to be able to engage with folks through the, through the Q&A box. Uh, and other than that, I think uh, the chat is not enabled for everyone, but if you need to specifically message either uh, myself or Elizabeth Hanlon, if you're having any technical difficulties, you should be able to do that through the chat or for the, through the Q&A as well. So as I said, the Arctic Initiative is really delighted to be hosting this conversation, but we could not be doing it without the Arctic Mayors Forum, who has been our collaborator uh, and partner in putting on this project. And we're really delighted for the opportunity to be co-hosting something with Arctic Mayors Forum uh, because we know that the cities on the ground and the people on the ground in the Arctic have the best understanding of what's happening and what those communities need. So I wanna turn it over now uh, to Patty Bruins for a few words from the Arctic Mayors Forum and just to say how delighted we are to have them as collaborators. Thanks so much, Patty, Tur turn it over to you. Thanks, uh, thanks so much. Um, we are absolutely thrilled to be uh, collaborating with our partners at the uh, at the Belfer Center, and we hope that this is the first of many uh, webinars that we do with you on on a whole variety of topics. But um, as Brittany said, my name is Patty Bruns. I'm honored to be the Secretary General of the Arctic Mayors Forum. I'm actually joining you today from Kiruna in northern uh, in Arctic Sweden, uh, where I'm engaging in uh, conversation. Uh, actually with the, the with the EU Committee of Regions and trying to get them engaged a little bit more in some of the things that we're dealing with in the Arctic. So just a few words about Arctic Mayors Forum. Arctic Mayors Forum is a relatively new but a really important actor on the Arctic governance front. We formally established in 2019 and our mission is to ensure the participation of mayors and elected community leaders at Arctic governance tables so that the values, goals, and interests of Arctic peoples are voiced and considered. Our common goal is for our citizens to have good lives in sustainably developed and resilient communities. We currently have 16 members, but we are actively growing our membership to ensure that the forum is truly representative of the Arctic. We uh, have our chair is now in Norway. So Ida um, has been our chair for the last uh, year. Um, we just had a general assembly. So she has turned over that baton to Tromsø, the mayor of Tromsø, Gunnar Wilhelmsen. But Norway will continue to be our, our leader until 2025. As we move forward, uh, you can expect to hear a lot more from AMF and, and uh, as we share what works in our changing communities, we'll also identifying emerging challenges. And that's why I'm just so thrilled that uh, three of our members are here with us today. So I'm gonna turn it over to Nadia now to introduce uh, the panelists and just uh, once again, say thank you very, very much for this opportunity and uh, looking forward to the discussion. Um. Thank you, Patty, so much. And those of you who are joining us today, my name is uh, Nadia Filimonova and I'm a postdoctoral fellow with the Arctic Initiative. So as uh, Brittany mentions in her, mentioned in her introductory words that cities globally are the, at the front line of uh, rising climatic risks. And globally, there has been uh, understanding among policymakers and academics that 
cities have a very unique uh, ability to address uh, those uh, uh, climatic challenges uh, by being confronted uh, directly by the occurring and uh, future changes. However, if we zoom into the Arctic region, the focus of discussions on environmental issues and climate related issues has been predominantly on state level to a lesser degree on uh, Arctic indigenous communities or on intergovernmental uh, institutions like the Arctic uh, Council. And cities in the Arctic has been mainly left out of those major discussions. Just to give you a quick example that the Arctic Council's 2016 Arctic Resilience Report barely mentions urban areas in the polar region. However, it is important to emphasize uh, that uh, um, it is a uh, uh, city's resilience to the uh, in the Arctic to climatic cha challenges is crucial, as around two thirds of the region's four million population uh, reside in urban settlements, and in some parts of the urban Arctic, the um, population is uh, likely to grow. And cities are commonly uh, uh, vulnerable to climatic cha challenges due to the immobility of their urban infrastructure, their res res residents' cultural and historical connectedness to their pl a place of living and birth, and cities are high reliance on uh, technology now. However, uh, cities in the Arctic face unique challenges to address climate change uh, because of their geographical remoteness, uh, small size of their population, uh, and severe uh, na uh, weather events that are coupled by the hardships, for instance, to attract foreign investment in, the, in those urban territories. And cities in the Arctic are obviously familiar with uh, weather hazards. However, the increasing pace of climate change that is happening in the region now pose additional uh, and will uh, represent additional challenges to the urban areas. Areas, in addition to various social, economic, and political issues that some of the cities in the region are already facing uh, now. So today event uh, aims to highlight cities' perspectives on resilience and climate governance in the Arctic, to bridge um, discussions across different uh, government uh, levels on how to address those uh, various challenges that are happening uh, in, the, uh, in the region. And uh, for our uh, event, uh, uh, we uh, I'm honored to present uh, our uh, speakers. Um, to provide us a Norwegian perspective, we are honored to have, uh, to have Ida Maria Pinjeret, mayor of Budo, Norway. She has been mayor of Budo since 2015 and was re-elected for a second term in 2019. She is the current chair of both Arctic Mayors Forum and Sultan Regional Council. While in office, she's uh, only from Nud University, where she works as a senior advisor at the Faculty of Education and uh, Arts. Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, to give us a, an Alaskan perspective, we are honored to have Bryce Ward, mayor of Fairbanks North Star, Star Borough, Alaska. Bryce was elected as the uh, 12th mayor of Fairbanks North Star Borough in October 2018. He served on the North Pole City Council for one year prior to being elected as a mayor of the city of North Pole and served two consecutive terms from October 2012 to October 2018. His civic activities uh, included volunteering with the Boy Scouts uh, of America in Fairbanks, North Pole. Thank you so much for joining us today. And shifting our focus back to the European Arctic, we are honored to have with us uh, Annie Kamurin, development strategist of the city of Umeå, Sweden. Uh, as climate transition officer for Umeå, Annika serves the city committee as an expert of the municipality. She coordinates the uh, nationally funded project Climate Neutral Umeå 2030 and is a part of Umeå's participation in the European mission Climate Neutral and Smart Cities at their pilot city project. Annika is also responsible for the local climate uh, contract email climate uh, roadmap. Thank you so much for joining us today. So I would like to start our conversation um, by bringing some uh, 
local perspectives on the understanding of resilience. So based on your ex uh, experience working in the municipality and according to your opinion, what does it mean to be a resilient city in the Arctic context? And a kind of a small follow-up question, what are the main challenges that your current, uh, that your municipality is currently faced with or might face under the occurring climatic challenges in the region? Um, and I think I would like to start with uh, perspectives from, from Buddha. Uh, please, Ida, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, uh, Nadia. And uh, first of all, I think uh, that resilience in the Arctic urban context uh, depends on how we as communities are working together for the urban Arctic and in the urban Arctic. Uh, in one of our schools, here in Buda, they have a saying that they are educating headwind competent pupils. And to me, the resilience in the urban Arctic has to do with how we can develop a mindset uh, for, the lives we, for the lives we live here. The waves are maybe higher and the storm are stronger uh, but, and hits us more often. Uh, so the people in the Arctic had to be prepared for that in another way in for, than, in, for example, in Barcelona or Brussels, uh, where I am now. And uh, with this, I also mean that we have to build knowledge and creativity for the people living in the urban Arctic. Uh, we need creative solutions for ordinary and daily problems. Um, for example, if the ferry don't show up and you can go back to the kids after school, who do you call? <laughs> and uh, I think that this is uh, one kind of question that uh, our people meet uh, in the Arctic. And uh, that is also one of the most important things of the, for the Arctic urban uh, resilience, that we own the problems together as a society and that we have to lose them together and uh, find solutions together for them. And of course, that we have to plan for the future together uh, and have good plans for that. So at the second question, uh, what are the challenges facing uh, the city in addressing the climate change? I think one of the challenges in the Arctic cities is that there are large, large distances. Um, the mobility is more complicated, both for people, but uh, also for all the goods that we have here. We have a lot of uh, resources here. And uh, climate change is already hitting us and is, has its consequences. Um, for example, we have more landslides than we had just uh, 10 years ago and uh, rising water. And all of this we have to plan and prepare for in another way than we did before. And of course, uh, we have uh, to invest in uh, climate good solutions uh, for the future when we are building new buildings, school, elderly houses, uh, and all these things we have to uh, think about when planning uh, the cities, as all the cities in the world. But I think in the Arctic, we also had to plan for this, uh, how the climate changes are hitting us uh, maybe uh, earlier than, uh, than in other places. So that was uh, some of my remarks in the start. Thank you either so much. And yes, I especially want to highlight that even a building in the Arctic is so hard because there is a short uh, time period for where it's actually possible to do something it, uh, because winters are really harsh. Um, uh, thank you so much again. And um, I would like to turn our focus now to the North America and uh, uh, invite Bryce to give some Alaskan perspectives. Yes, thank you. Um, you know, when we talk about resiliency in the Arctic, it's really interesting to look at our own history uh, in the interior of Alaska. Um, resiliency back in the day used to mean that we would uh, supply many of our own goods or do many much of our manufacturing here locally. Um, and as we've shifted in, in technology, we, as we've shifted as a, as a culture, I would say, uh, we've become more uh, consumer-based. And the, the term resiliency has kind of has, has shifted or evolved. Um, and, and now where we used to talk about resiliency, uh, the ability for us to do our own power generation, for an example, um, as, as a community separate from other communities, resiliency now means connecting these communities together. Um, and as um, uh, Ida mentioned, uh, there's, there's huge vast distances in the Arctic. Uh, our closest kind of urban community is about 300 miles away. Um, and so the, the difficulty when we talk about resiliency from that perspective is how do you connect those communities together so that 
infrastructure can support each other, whether it be power generation or utility, other utilities. Um, I, I think that's certainly a challenge. Um, I also think, you know, we look at challenges uh, for resiliency is looking at life cycle, um, not just life cycle of buildings and infrastructure, um, but the materials and the goods that we use, uh, it, it seems nowadays tend to be uh, more consumable uh, and, and there's a lot more waste associated with, uh, with those goods. Whereas in the past, we maybe would recycle or, or use those products um, more for their lifespan. Um, you know, uh, there's, uh, I'm a contractor here in Fairbanks and many times we run into buildings that have um, components of uh, refuse that were used as part of building materials for roofing or for walls, et cetera. Um, and we tend not to see that anymore. We tend to just throw those materials away. Um, so I think that that tends to be a challenge as we talk about resiliency um, is we're very much dependent on supply chains, on getting goods and services here, and not so much on manufacturing or doing um, that work of producing the goods that we need here locally. Uh, thank you, Bryce. Thank you so much. And again, thank you for um, actually highlighting one of the biggest problems in terms of delivery that also connected to the high cost, but also um, the time when those uh, goods should be uh, de delivered to those remote territories, as for instance, in winter time, one of them, the only connection uh, could be uh, by airfare, and if it's not sometimes possible to do the weather hazards. Um, so I want to focus back on the uh, European Arctic and invite uh, uh, Annika to give the perspectives from Umeå. Annika, I think you are muted. Sorry. Now, now you can hear me. Um, so, um, thank you. Um, so, Umeå is a middle-sized city in the north of Sweden. Um, we're, um, we have two universities, a lot of students, a lot of culture, a lot of skiing lanes. Uh, and we see ourselves a lot in the European context um, as we speak of resilience, uh, we see ourselves a lot as maybe every other city in the in, in Europe, but as you were sp uh, talking about today, uh, with the Arctic characteristics. Um, so what when we talk about resilience here in Umeå, um, of course, as uh, the other speakers uh, have been talking about, we talk about um, circularity. Um, and uh, for example, which is very much um, in the media here uh, for us regarding uh, rare metals in order to uh, transform from fossil fuels to, for example, electric cars, how can we work with urban mining uh, instead of new mines. Um, we also want, need to continue working on clean energy. Uh, here in Umeå, we are, um, luckily, we have a lot of water power, um, which is uh, also used for the very large nationally funded uh, industrial development here in the north of Sweden with the fossil fuel steel production and uh, others, other things. Um, and as uh, the two mayors were speaking, uh, the long distances, <laughs> we have to keep our area uh, available, but it has to be available without the use of fossil fuels. So how can we do that? Um, but last and not least, um, we need to build on the high level of social trust, social progress and social capital here in the north of Sweden. Uh, we have, um, in the European context, the northern Sweden uh, is uh, scoring the highest on the social progress index. So we have a, an excellent opportunity to work together with 
uh, actors in the city, um, uh, citizens, civic society, and so on. So, um, yeah, the challenges um, are, of course, connected to uh, the way of speaking with the resilience. Um, we have a large card uh, dependence here, uh, as the two mayors also were speaking about. Um, both personal uh, transport and transport of goods. Uh, and this is actually making transport and mobility uh, our largest CO2 emission uh, area. Um, and uh, I was so glad that Bryce was mentioning this um, consumption. Um, we have a high income and high education level here in the Umeå, most of us. Uh, but that also means that we have a large uh, consumption-based CO2 emission. And uh, as it is very important for uh, us and our politicians to uh, work with a just climate transition, uh, we need to look it into these consumption-based um, CO2 emissions. Um, and uh, yeah, so small but very concrete example of the climate change here in Umeå. Um, we both have more snow and less snow. Uh, we uh, have to move our ski lanes from where they were before uh, and move them um, further to the west where it's uh, more dependent, uh, the snow is more dependent. And this is, um, but this is just a small, uh, the, the climate change is just uh, starting to notice here in uh, Umeå. And um, uh, I would say that the crisis awareness uh, maybe is not, um, as common as it maybe should be here in Umeå. So uh, we also do, this is, this is one challenge for us actually, uh, to, to see that this very large consumption level, uh, based emissions uh, from our high educated and high income uh, inhabitants, how can we work with that? Yes. Thank you, Annika, for bringing this perspective and challenges. And I think there are all these talks of how small and medium-sized cities can innovate uh, in their um, politics to address climate change. So um, outlining all these different uh, and at the same time, sometimes like similar challenges that cities uh, in Alaska and in Northern Europe are, are facing uh, now. So what could what could be the concrete examples from your cities on how you build uh, resilience or um, and what actions, if any, should, for instance, national governments or, or business can uh, can uh, take in order to uh, uh, kind of uh, enhance a city's uh, resilience uh, in the Arctic? Um, and Ida, if you can start, please. Yes, thank you, Nadia. Uh, in Buda, uh, we are in a great transition in so many ways, uh, but actually we have, uh, the government decided uh, 10 years ago to move a fighter base that we have placed uh, actually in the middle of the city almost. Uh, and it's it has been moved now uh, and uh, we are moving, and there was the runway also for the city, and we are now moving the runway uh, up to the south, and we are making space for building a new city. And in um, this work, which is a great transition for the whole city, we uh, have thought that we have to build this as a very smart and climate smart city for the future. And uh, we have kind of developed uh, during these uh, years, working with, with this project, uh, a mindset for how we can plan uh, and use the areas uh, as a, uh, a plan for a zero emission area and also use the area as a test bed for uh, new technology, for climate friendly um, uh, solutions and uh, also for public health solutions, all these things that are so important in modern cities. And um, 
we also, uh, as Umo uh, said and Annika said, uh, we also have uh, hydropower and we have a lot of hydropower uh, in, uh, in our region and we are um, also able to develop uh, both hydropower and maybe other uh, kind of uh, energy, uh, uh, energy um, sources uh, for the future. Uh, we are working with that a lot and we have some co concrete plans uh, for how can we use uh, um, uh, zero emission energy sources uh, also uh, in the future in building the new city. So this is how we develop our city. Uh, and we also in this project, we for example uh, are working in a uh, project, a EU project uh, that is called City Loops, uh, where we are working on how we can reuse concretes uh, from the old airport uh, in the new city and also reuse buildings and reuse uh, uh, buildings that have been uh, on the earlier fighter base. This is a great change in the mindset for just uh, in, in 10 years uh, or uh, eight or maybe even though only five years there ha happened so much in how we think about um, how to use materials and uh, how to kind of really take part in the, uh, in the green transition that we have to do for the future. And we also, uh, of course, it's important for us when, as I said, uh, when we are building new buildings, we have to have high standards for uh, climate friendly buildings and sustainable, uh, sustainable uh, development of the of the city. Uh, so this is kind of a big, big work that uh, we can do it only in the city hall or in the city council. This is something that we have to work on the mindset for everybody living in the city. And uh, how to do that is, <laughs> is a big question, but, uh, but I think we are working on, um, uh, we are on a good way. And we are also working a lot with the people on uh, what, uh, how can they make good choices for their everyday lives uh, in, uh, in, um, building a, a climate resilience uh, for the city. But I think also that uh, uh, this change in, for example, mobility, uh, for example, in green aviation, we have uh, a aviation company in Buda, which uh, has a lot of uh, short routes uh, planes, and uh, they are uh, right now changing uh, um, changing the plans for uh, how they are going to salute this in the future and they are uh, aiming for uh, having a green aviation for the future and this is how we have to work on all the different uh, uh, places uh, in in the society and also the harbor for example concrete uh, we have uh, uh, electrified more uh, of the um, capacity in in the harbor and we're also working with how the harbor can be a um, future harbor uh, and a cl climate friendly harbor for those who want uh, to take climate friendly choices uh, so i think that the municipalities uh, are really uh, able to do big things uh, but we also have to speak with our neighbors uh, across the borders and uh, and do this together Thank you, Ida. First of all, like really exciting projects and looking forward to learn more uh, in terms of implementation. And I really like this cooperative approach and city, citizen participatory approach. I think this is so crucial to have this bottom up and obviously engaging with different uh, stakeholders, uh, including business. Um, then uh, Bruce, can you Bryce, can you take on uh, the question? Yeah, thank you, Nadia. Um... So, I, you know, when we look at our community, I think one of the things that we recognize is when you when you talk about changing um, habits of a community, you have to look at what the motivators are. And, and there's certainly folks that have kind of these higher ambitions for um, how they impact the environment. But I think most folks that we that we deal with in our community um, are, are motivated by cost. Um, how much does it cost them to to live here? How much does it cost them to uh, provide goods for their family and heat for their homes. And so when we look at our what we try to do to influence that, uh, we really try to focus on those areas that touch the most people um, the greatest. And that's that really comes down to two things. Um, it's the, the cost uh, of energy uh, through power and then through heating our homes. Many of us know living in the, the Arctic that uh, for us to live here compared to someone more closer to the equator, 
uh, there's a considerable amount more energy that we use um, than other, other residents across the globe. And, and that adds to additional cost. Uh, and so for our community, um, we have a gentleman here that, that works uh, at a facility. It's, it's the Coal Climate Housing Research Center. Um, it was one of the founders, and, and he likes to say, uh, he asked the question in, in conferences, he says, what's the cheapest form of energy? And, you know, folks are throwing out different, you know, solar or wind or hydro, and, and th those are not the right answer. The right answer is the, the cheapest form of energy is the one that you never have to use. Uh, and he, he approaches that from a building uh, perspective, uh, which is one of the highest users of energy across the globe is our infrastructure, our buildings. Uh, and so how do we continue to work on um, improving the efficiency of the buildings that we do live in, that we work in every day in the Arctic? Um, and, and that's where we find the biggest bang for the buck, if you will, or the, the most reward, uh, especially as we talk about our impact on the environment and the climate, um, is making the most out of uh, the infrastructure that we do put in. Uh, looking at our, our energy needs for lighting, uh, you know, we don't use a whole lot of energy for lighting in the summertime when there's 24 hours of daylight, but in the wintertime, we use a tremendous amount. Uh, are we using LEDs and the most efficient technology in our infrastructure, our public infrastructure, um, to help reduce our costs, to help reduce our impacts that we have um, on the environment, on our community? Uh, and, and that goes for heating as well. Heating is another very large uh, consumer of energy in the Arctic. Uh, and so looking at our buildings, are they uh, well insulated? Are they um, efficient in their design, utilizing solar gain, um, uh, minimizing uh, windows on the north side, maximizing windows on the south side? Um, these are things that we do with our public infrastructure. And then we encourage our, our, our industry locally to incorporate in their design. Uh, the previous mayor of the Fairbanks North Star Borough has a, a, a net zero home um, that uh, is, is completely heated uh, with a small amount of wood in the wintertime, and then most of the year is heated by solar. Um, and so looking at that technology, how we incorporate it into our public infrastructure, and then how we help share that with the community so they can incorporate that into their own home designs and their own practices um, are, are really critical. I, I talked earlier about this, this idea of resiliency between communities. Um, when we talk about power generation, renewables tend to be very challenging for small power grids uh, because of the large swings that you may have, whether it be solar or wind. Uh, we don't tend to have a lot of hydro in the interior, um, but we, we don't have necessarily the big base to be able to take those uh, swings and adjustments in renewable energy. Uh, so how we can connect our grid to other communities and build a bigger base load, which allows us to increase the amount of uh, renewable energy that we're able to have on the grid uh, is another aspect that we're looking at. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Bryce, so much for actually bringing concrete examples and really perspectives for people who are living in more of the southern areas. Sometimes we kind of don't understand that how crucial it is even to have this specific design for for the urban for housing in urban areas uh, uh, above the Arctic Circle, um, and then I would like to turn to Anika, who is, please. Yes, thank you. Um, in Umeå, we focus a lot of, um, at least right now, we focus a lot of governance. Um, we talk a lot about cooperation uh, at the local level uh, or even <laughs> further down at the municipality and the municipal companies and then the local level here in Umeå and then the cooperation we can have with the national level and the cooperation within EU. So um, I would like to focus on the local um, climate contract we have just uh, put up here in Umeå, which is called Umeå Climate Roadmap. Um, there are um, almost 40 organizations, that's businesses, all the um, academia, academia, the two universities and RISE uh, Research Institute here in Sweden. Uh, the, um, the region uh, responsible for healthcare and uh, then uh, 
both large and small companies. Um, they have signed up to this local climate contract um, to um, contrib contrib contribute to um, lowering our CO2 emissions here in Umeå. And um, they um, committed to a really fast change to contrib contribute to a really fast uh, change. And also in that's um, our politicians want us to um, they want us to to work accordingly uh, to the Paris Agreement, and we if we are serious about that, we have to um, lower our emissions. Um, here in Sweden, it's about uh, twenty percent per year uh, for a, almost every city. That's a huge amount. Um, but this is what um, the the local actors have been signed up. To committed to in the local climate contract, and now we are um, moving forward with uh, in an innovative way uh, of organizing and cooperation uh, here in Umeå, in order to um, just put up some um, cooperations uh, to lower the CO2 emissions, and these can uh, hopefully be made by the large companies together with the small companies uh, across uh, business sectors. Um, so it's going to be very exciting to see how this uh, local climate uh, contract organization and work is um, moving forward. Um, we uh, in Umeå uh, are very glad also that we have been appointed uh, one of the 100 climate neutral and smart cities in the EU. Uh, and this, um, we also got a large funding here um, in uh, 2023. Uh, and that will uh, actually, we can uh, even more focus on these government issues uh, on the local level. Um, we find um, uh, a small example. Uh, we have this strategic group within this uh, Umeå Climate Roadmap uh, Network, uh, which is uh, companies and organizations which have been committed to an extra amount of um, participation within the, the local climate contract work. Uh, and they were so committed to doing this together in Umeå. Um, we, um, yeah, um, I would say that we, um, sorry, the light went off. Um, I would say that, that um, um, we went out on thin ice on this local climate contract. Uh, um, networking, but we find ourselves in uh, a very good position now with all the local actors so that we can work together. Um, when we talk about citizen and civic society, uh, the, we focus a lot of this just transition and, and that is integrating social sustainability into the climate transition work. Um, we have a specific initiative which is called UMECOM uh, where we have these citizen workshops uh, in bringing new ideas to the table and to the municipality, but also all these actors uh, in Umeå in order to make uh, small local initiatives uh, together with large local initiatives. Um, yeah. Um, we, as I said, we focus a lot of uh, on uh, social sustainability, and within the social sustainability, we focus even more on the, uh, gender equality work. Uh, and we have made been made been making these uh, travel surveys, where uh, a crucial fact is that we can see that if the men in Umeå lived in, living in Umeå uh, travel like the women live, live in Umeå, the the 
transport goals or the sustainable mobility goals for our city would be reached already. So we can actually, uh, by having these really um, concrete data for our mobility, uh, we can actually design actions so that that's, um, we focus on the right groups. Um, we also uh, do a lot of work regarding large um, employ employ employment areas uh, where they're uh, in the healthcare, where the hospital is, is a large, uh, uh, predominantly uh, women working. Uh, and then we also focus on another uh, part of the town where there's uh, like a small industrial areas where there predominantly is um, men working. So we can make different kind of actions uh, regarding these areas in order to reach our goals uh, for sustainable mobility. Um, maybe some closing words also about our participation uh, within the biosphere reserve. Um, the, you can see our um, river Ume Elven uh, behind me, uh, and that's um, uh, a part of the biosphere reserve, Vindelervel uh, Juchtadaka which where we uh, have a lot of actors from the coast up to the mountains where uh, the river Vindelelven starts. Um, and here in this uh, biosphere reserve uh, organization, we have businesses, uh, public authorities, um, local stakeholders, and also indigenous actors. Their uh, Vindelelven is known for the largest or the longest um, reindeer, um, uh, yeah, what's that called? It's not called reindeer transport, <laughs> but when they go from their uh, summer uh, to winter um, habitats. Uh, so that's very interesting also to work uh, together uh, with uh, in these big areas, as also the Alaskan mayor was talking about, how can we work together uh, in in these large areas with these large um, where we have long distances. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Annika, so much for bringing all these uh, great uh, examples in different areas of work of the municipality. And again, like really excited to learn more as uh, those projects will develop. So uh, now we're sort of running uh, up always uh, the um, um, our discussion and move on to the uh, Q and A section uh, of our event. So if you have an, a, a question, please uh, write it in the chat box. Um, and um, I would like with to start with the first uh, question that brings sort of um, Icelandic uh, perspective uh, on of using uh, geothermal uh, energy. And uh, the, um, the participant uh, asks uh, if any of the municipalities that are presented in discussion consist, uh, considering the application of geothermal energy, heating homes and buildings. So any of the panel participants, please jump on to uh, address this question. Uh, Bryce? Yeah, I can tackle that one for Fairbanks. So we tend not to have as much geothermal as Iceland does. We do have some isolated pockets, but it's not generally as, as hot. Uh, primarily in Fairbanks, the, the community that's using that is uh, actually Chena Hot Springs. Uh, they have a, a model that uses a lower temperature uh, water to generate power. Um, we also have an organization in town, uh, CCHRC, I mentioned earlier, Cold Climate Housing Research Center, um, that is working uh, with NREL to uh, explore cold, cli uh, cold climate heat pumps. And so using uh, the heat in the air, even at low temperatures to, to heat our homes. So I think the technology is being adapted uh, to where you don't have to have the extreme heat uh, that you would typically see with most geothermal. And we could start using this even in, in uh, power generation for co-generation, not just power, but heat. Uh, for homes and buildings uh, as well. Thank you. Yeah. 
Any other panelists would like to jump on this question? Yes, Ida, please. Yes, Nadia. Uh, yes, uh, we are uh, having some projects on uh, this. It's not a big uh, issue in uh, or a, a big thing <laughs> uh, in uh, in Buda either. But uh, for, for example, right now that uh, uh, the university are building a building which uh, where they try a ground uh, heated building. So these are kind of one of the things that we are testing out in in our city, and we have to to do that also for the future. So, thank you. Thank you, uh, Ida. Um, I think we can move on uh, with the second uh, question. So how do you think um, uh, could be the role of ecosystem restoration uh, in building resilience applied in the municipal, uh, in, the, uh, in the urban areas in the Arctic? Yes, I can say something about that. Um, in this uh, Umeå Climate Roadmap, we um, have um, yeah, the additional uh, climate actions, which not actually reduce climate emissions, but make um, uh, they uh, absorb uh, CO2. So we are talking quite a lot about restoring uh, wetlands uh, as a way of both um, absorbing CO2, but of course uh, to enhance the, the biodiversity and also uh, putting into action climate adaptation. So this is uh, a really a win-win-win situation with restoring wetlands. Uh, so th this is an um, interesting question for us. We haven't been doing so much work, but we want to do it. Uh, and also regarding, um, which we have all of us here, Norway, Alaska and Sweden, um, the, the issue regarding uh, our large wood areas, how can we use them in a, um, a resilient way in order to to have the win-win-win situation. I think it's very important to see that it can have, uh, you can uh, put, it, put on different issues uh, when, when you uh, try to address one question. Thank you, Annika. Um, so in, in several uh, presentations, uh, there was mentioning of encouraging, for instance, the, the use of new materials for construction uh, in the municipalities and encouraging uh, new ways for transportation and uh, recycling building materials. And that would obviously need some uh, new governmental regulations. So how do you think you can uh, elaborate and enforce those uh, regulations and rules? And how long will it, uh, do you think it will take? Yes, Ida, thank you. Thank you. Uh, this is one, uh, it's, it's a big question for us and we are working a lot uh, and have a lot of cooperation with the authorities uh, about this because we have to do this very fast <laughs> and we have to do the change very fast. And right now I'm actually in Brussels where we are discussing how fast everything is going uh, here uh, for, um, because we are, we are in a hurry, you know, uh, and, uh, and in this we have to to change the rules uh, and kind of build um, build a law that is uh, also meeting the the needs that we have. So we have to have a, a close cooperation uh, with the authorities uh, in our countries. But it's also that's why also the Arctic Mayors Forum is an important forum because when we were to get work together, we see that we have some of the same problems that we need to uh, solve together. Uh, and when we were working together across the border it's uh, like the, the voice is even stronger uh, from the local per perspective. So I think that you have to uh, work on the concrete projects and, and, the, uh, and listen to the locals when you are developing uh, the rules for the future. And this has to be uh, a fast track <laughs> for a better climate in the future. Thank you.
Thank you. Uh, thank you, either Annika. Yes, I just want to add uh, to it's important with regulation, but also to to make uh, like Ida was talking about test beds within uh, the city. Uh, in Umeå, we are right now uh, trying to um, put a uh, building material uh, recycling unit uh, starting up that uh, together with local building actors. Um, so it's it's also important to 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 get the local examples uh, at the same time as we have to be in Brussels and other places where we can um, contribute to um, keeping the regulation uh, where we should have it. Uh, yeah, so I think one thing to maybe add to this is as we talk about um, advancement and we talk about um, what I would say innovation, um, it's I think a, a really different, um, maybe a, a different perspective to think about. Um, there's there's two ways that you can do this. Um, I think one, you can regulate. You can, as the local government, as the state or the, the federal government can, can set standards uh, which are needed. There's There's boundaries that have to be established um, but when we really start getting into this idea of innovation, there has to be a, a level of freedom for the community to kind of explore what works, to look at the, the available resources to the community, whether it be a, a waste byproduct or whether it be uh, new resources, and, and how they can take that and, and incorporate it into a design and an idea that works. And so it, it's this idea of, of, um, of regulating or motivating and I think if, if we maybe think a little bit differently that we can get to the, some of the same results through motivating our community and our industries to take that approach, that innovative approach, take these ideas and these concepts and, and think about them in ways that we haven't done before, um, I think we could see some really positive results. So I think regulation is a piece of that, but I think we also have to think about how we motivate our community to really take that next step and, and to make it their own, make it something that they have an ownership piece in as well. Thank you. Thank you, Bryce, so much. And just to kind of uh, wrap up with the last uh, question and building on what you just uh, mentioned, um, do you think that Arctic cities can use indigenous knowledge to, to increase the resilience of Arctic future cities? Yeah, so I, I think um, to build upon that, um, I mentioned uh, the organization in our town that uh, is, is doing a lot of this work. Um, they're actually working with local communities to look at home design that may be a, a, a culturally significant historic designs. Um, one of the, the great examples of this is um, many of our uh, indigenous peoples uh, in the interior ha have this certain type of design that includes um, a, a ventilation system that was really very advanced, um, which we now incorporate into our buildings as, as a mechanical ventilation, but the design that they had originally come up with uh, for their homes was, was a natural ventilation. Um, it, it created uh, air movement through the building so you didn't get moisture and mold buildup um, in the wintertime. And so looking at how um, that technology has evolved over time, uh, and then how we've kind of lost that and come back. I think there's certainly much to gain um, from uh, the indigenous peoples that have lived in the Arctic for quite some time um, that, uh, that can be incorporated into our build buildings designs uh, nowadays. Thank you. Thank you, Bryce. Uh, Annika, did you want to add something? No, I think we can move on. Okay, uh, so with that, I would like to close uh, our event for today and thank everyone and give um, uh, our panelists the floor for their final comments and thoughts. And I think we learned a lot uh, about what is uh, what about the projects, about innovation, about 
um, cooperative way from uh, from the civ uh, civic point uh, of view, but also like business and uh, across the uh, different uh, levels of governance. So please, uh, Ida, can you uh, provide us with some final thoughts? Yes, thank you so much, uh, Nadia, uh, and thank you for the for this panel. It was really nice to uh, take part in it. Uh, I think that uh, what can uh, you know what can worldwide cities learn from Arctic cities' experiences? Uh, I think that we have some points. Uh, first of all, we we need to uh, use sustainable development and good plans, and we have to. Uh, plan for the future together. And we also need a global dialogue about the Arctic. Uh, as the indigenous people here often say, nothing about us without us. And I think that's very important also when we are speaking about the Arctic. A lot of people live in the Arctic and there are many cities there and we need to uh, be in the dialogue also about the Arctic uh, and the global dialogue. And then uh, we have uh, the cooperation between the cities, the municipalities and across the borders. I think it's so important for the future. Uh, we are um, a peaceful place uh, in the world. The Arctic, uh, the Arctic area is still peaceful and uh, hopefully it will be also in the future. Uh, and we have a big uh, job for bringing that also uh, forward. So in the end, we have a Norwegian saying that we have to use uh, our, or we have to have cold heads and warm hearts uh, when we are planning together uh, for the future for our kids. So thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Ida, for such a nice word. Thank you so much, uh, Bryce. Yes, thank you. Um, and I, I really like that uh, cold hands and warm hearts that that speaks to to my heart <laughs> uh, in Alaska. Uh, I, you know, I, I think as we kind of wrap this up, this conversation, I really appreciate everyone's um, perspective and, and what they had to add. You know, I think what's really important as we talk about moving forward, as we talk about the future, it's important that we focus on um, on these areas where we can get collaboration. Um, and we talk about um, how we can motivate our community and our industries um, to help us come to these kind of common goals, which I think is good stewardship of our resources, good stewardship of our environment. Um, and I, I think that does require a bit of a shift in the conversation um, that, uh, that, that growth is not a bad thing. And I think when we tend to think about the Arctic, and this was a few of the comments that came in, um, we're not a fishbowl. People live here. Um, people, are, they, they have families, they grow. Um, there is a lot of things that happen in the Arctic um, that are not just, uh, it, it's not a fun exotic place to go. It's not a Disneyland um, or an amusement park, but um, there are families, there are lives, there are people that, that um, call this place their home and have for generations. And so we have to recognize that when we talk about this discussion of resiliency and climate um, and that uh, we have to incorporate that into um, our ideas of what, what a future looks like for the Arctic. Um, because I think it does look different for um, the communities north uh, and south of the equator than it does for the communities um, a, a kind of a more um, a tropical or, or warmer climate. Um, so it's important that we have those conversations and, and don't carte blanche um, apply uh, policies that maybe work in other areas to communities where it may not um, very well work at all. Um, but I think we can still get to the same end, uh, which is that we do want to have good stewardship of our environment, of our communities, um, and be good, um, uh, good, good humans. So with cold hands and warm hearts. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much, Bryce. <laughs> Annika? Mm -hmm. Yes, I, uh, I also like that ex uh, expression. We have it here in Sweden as well. Um, Yes, just a short uh, closing remark. Um, you could be a bit um, sad uh, hearing and uh, reading about the international climate uh, negotiations, uh, how they are moving forward, but moving forward very, very slowly. Uh, and I think we can learn from the Arctic that we have a really strong local commitment um, 
in Umeå we say that we have it have a do-it-yourself spirit. I think that's actually common for a lot of cities here in the Arctic, where the distances are long. Uh, you have to have kind of a do-it-yourself spirit. That doesn't mean that we shouldn't cooperate, because that could be like the base of cooperation. Um, so I will say that I strongly believe that the, the the strong local commitments can overcome these harsh international negotiations not going so well. Um, and I also would like to thank you for uh, being asked to be a part of this presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Annika. And on this really positive note, I'm ending this uh, discussions. And I would like once again to thank uh, our uh, panelists for sharing their perspectives and uh, knowledge on how to build resilience from the uh, uh, in the urban Arctic and what cities across the globe can learn from those uh, northern urban areas. And for all the participants who joined us uh, online today and posing um, their great question. Thank you again. And uh, this is, as Patty was mentioned, one of the events in a row. So if you're not subscribed to social uh, Arctic Initiative social media and stay tuned uh, on uh, research and event activities. Thank you so much again.